Don't judge a book by its cover. It's one of the first life lessons you're taught as a child, and <laughs> one you've probably ignored ever since. And as a lover of books, I am constantly judging books by their covers. It's part of the fun. It's not hurting anyone. Well, <laughs> it's severely hurting my bank balance, but I pretend I do not see. I've said it before and I'll say it again, buying books and reading books are two entirely different hobbies. Don't you forget it. So basically, this week I wanted to put this theory to the test and actually judge books by their covers. I'm going to buy books where I have no prior knowledge of the plot or what they're about. Instead, I'm just going to pick books based on how pretty they are like the very serious book critic that I am. So I had <laughs> maybe too much fun browsing bookstores and picking my favorite book covers. And here they are, the creme de la creme, chef's kiss. The man was too stunned to speak. But unfortunately and heartbreakingly, I could not afford to buy all of these books. And I don't wanna be living la vida broca, so I had to whittle them down. And to do this, I used Karma, who have very kindly sponsored today's video. And Karma is an app and Chrome extension which ensures you never miss a price drop or a coupon code. I save so much money from using this. Look, you can literally see all the price drops and all these different books that it keeps track of. So all you need to do is click the link down below to download Karma. And then when you're shopping on your favorite online stores, you can save the items that you like using the Karma button. You'll then get a notification when the items go on sale, have a relevant coupon, code or come back into stock and you can then organize your items into lists just like I did and on the Chrome version Karma will even scan the web to find you a relevant discount code and then apply them at the checkout automatically and you can even get cash back from a range of retailers and the best part is Karma is completely free to download so click the link down below download it and uh, get yourself some good Karma and also this is so exciting but I'm giving away $400 worth of books to five of you so you have 40 hours to enter all the details are on screen. And so here they are, these are the books that I ended up buying. And now I want to see if these have substance as well as style. Let's see if these books are more Instagram or Insta scam. And let's go! So, nice. Okay, the first book that I bought is this slim thing. And this book is called Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke. And I chose this book because the artwork on the cover just instantly grabbed my attention. It was giving me the vibe that this was going to be quite psychological and twisted. And I was not disappointed, my friends. And also, of course, the title is on the cover. And I think that is something that can also really draw us to a book. And in this case, it's so provocative. It completely draws you in. It reminds me of They Both Die at the End and other books like that. You know, I had to read this and I did. I read it all in one sitting <laughs> because from page one, it had me gripped. Eric LaRocca had me in the palm of their hand. Now, I don't often use the terms disgusting, depraved, twisted, and shocking in a positive way, but I will use them in that way right here because this is so good. It's horrifying in the best possible way. And also in exactly the way that it sets out to be. It's sadomasochistic, it's frenzied, it is wild. And it's basically about these two women who start talking online initially because one of them is trying to sell a family apple peeler. And through their conversations, they actually end up entering into a kind of online relationship, but they never meet in real life. And this relationship sort of just brings out the worst in both of them. And I thought a book like this is so fascinating where it kind of thinks about what can happen when online chat room conversations sort of spiral out of control and how on the internet we're just slightly displaced from reality. I mean, let's be real, the internet is somewhere where someone as daft as I am can have three quarters of a million subscribers. So like, <laughs> truly anything goes. And in this book, everything goes, including everyone's sanity. I think the thing is, on these chat rooms, people have the ability to say things and present themselves in ways that they probably wouldn't in the real world, on the offline world. And so everything in this book takes place through conversations, but we find out at the very beginning that these have been recorded for a police inquiry. So as of that moment, I was hooked. It's really captivating. It's really fucked up, but don't say I didn't warn you, okay? <laughs> I think the author actually wrote this in one frenzied kind of burst. And I think that actually helps the writing because conversations that we have on the internet are very spontaneous and fast paced. And so my main warning to you is make sure you read this on a day where you've got some time because you won't be able to put this down. I don't know where we go from here. Um, on to the next book. Hopefully next time I talk to you, things will not have gotten worse since we last spoke, okay? <laughs> Guys, um, things have gotten worse <laughs> since we last spoke. Firstly, because the old uh, Pandemi Lovato is getting pretty bad. But also, 
this book. So the photograph on this cover was taken by Maria Svarbova and the jacket design was by Sinem Erkas. And I'm not gonna lie, this was going in my basket the moment I saw this cover. I think what drew me to this is the weird liminal space that you see on this cover. Like this awkward spacing between the words, which is definitely a conscious typographical choice because the word of could easily have fit up here. There's also this space between the two figures who are facing straight ahead rather than kind of acknowledging each other. I like that there's this closeness, but also this huge chasm of distance. It's intimate in a way because they're two people half naked in a in the same water, but it's simultaneously a very sterile space. You know, the water has chlorine in it, the colour of this cover and the water is green and blue, it looks like um, a hospital. And their postures sort of mirror each other in a way, but then there's also fundamental differences, like their swimming caps are different colours. So I feel like you get this hostility as well as an intimacy all at the same time. And I think that makes the title of the book, Topics of Conversation, even more intriguing because it makes me think about what is being said in this space, what is communicated by these people and how the nature of conversation is that not everything is always completely one emotion or always received in exactly the same way that you intend it to be. So um, it's complex and nuanced and I liked that. So when do these characters feel distance? When do they feel intimacy? I wanted to read it to find out. And I also chose it because it says that this book is Sally Rooney-esque. And I'm a simple man. I see Sally Rooney and I purchase. And let me tell you, I am a sucker. I fell right into their little marketing ploy. Little known fact, the Jonas Brothers actually wrote their hit song, Sucker, about me because that's what I am. But you can't blame me because Sally Rooney is actually referenced twice on the cover, which I actually think <laughs> is a bit of a cheap act. And while I think that's a clever way of introducing a new up and coming writer to a pre-established fan base, I mean, I literally, <laughs> I did fall for it. I think to do it twice on the cover doesn't really let this new author speak for herself. And she's not like Sally Rooney. <laughs> she's nothing of the sort. I was very underwhelmed by this book. It's basically a series of conversations between one woman who is the narrator and then a series of other women who she encounters. And they talk about their experiences of womanhood and sexuality, but the tone is just so pretentious. Don't get me wrong, I thought it was clever how each conversation sort of ebbs and flows between, you know, the, the deep stuff and also non-important things. In ordinary conversations, we meander through the meaningful and the mundane. That's, that's how it works. But these sentences just run on and on and on and on and on. And when I say they run, they're not sprinting. They're like cross country running, marathon running. It takes its time. People relay whole monologues and a lot of the dialogue just felt very over stylized to me. And that's not because every book ever has to be really punchy because they don't. This for example is a book where the sentences are so long and there are so many clauses, more clauses than Santa's family in here. And yet it is so impactful. This however, just backtracks and fumbles its way through every sentence and it's painful after a while. It's not punchy, it's a punch to the face for buying it. Sally Rooney explores ideas through her characters and you grow with them and you observe them and you sort of empathize with their flaws because they are complicated and imperfect characters. Miranda Popkey kind of just sacrifices her characters to the lions for the sake of saying something thought provoking. And it just stops feeling natural after a while, to be honest. So this was disappointing. I still love the cover though. The only quote on the cover that doesn't sort of ride off the back of Sally Rooney's success is this one. And it says, it's brilliant, thoughtful and compelling. And this is a quote from the Daily Mail. And as usual, the Daily Mail is wrong. So <laughs> I didn't enjoy that book. Hopefully the next one is better. Don't judge books by their covers, friends. So this cover was designed by Greg Stadnick. And I'm not gonna lie to you, we're all friends here. I genuinely chose this purely because I love this shade of blue. And what about it? A little bit of blue going on for the Teen Vogue party. Anyway, um, I also thought that it was interesting because it's got two authors on the cover. So I was intrigued by how the project would be very collaborative and how there'd be two writers' voices, you know, working in tandem. Does teamwork make the dream work, you know? The cover also has these glitching birds on it, which sort of gave me sci-fi kind of energy. And I was also drawn in because it alludes to losing. And if there's one thing I'm good at, it is coming last. Honestly, relatable content. The book is called This Is How You Lose The Time War. This is also how you lose my attention because for the first like 70 pages, nothing happens. Nothing happens. It's one of those things where it's done intentionally and by the ending, you understand why you had all that build up and everything is explained in the second half. But for the first half, 
I was clueless. So I actually think that the reading experience might actually be way better on a second read. You know, once you already know all of the big twists, because this is big brain energy and mine is like this big. I felt like this book was intellectually bullying me. <laughs> I felt like I had one brain cell, half a brain cell, whilst reading this. Raise your hand if you've ever been personally victimized by a sci-fi book. And essentially, we have these two characters known as Red and Blue, who are fighting on different sides of a war. But it's a time war, because this is sci-fi and anything goes in sci-fi. And so essentially, as they travel through time, they leave messages for each other. For instance, to give you an example, um, like writing a letter in the bark of a tree, which then grows over a hundred years and the other person comes in chops the tree down to read the message. Stay with me here, I don't even know if I know what's going on. This is truly the blind leading the blind, and my prescription is high. The thing is though, each chapter is quite formulaic because you basically have the character, they're walking around for a little bit, they find the message, they then read the message. And that just happens again and again and again and again. But initially these letters are quite boastful and competitive, you know, they're competing. But as time goes on, and trust me, Time goes on. I felt like I was <laughs> in a time war because this, it was a slow read for me and it's not even that long, but basically they start to grow a bit of an affection for each other. And so the letters sort of reflect that. And truly these letters are the saving grace of this book because the deeper you delve into this book, the more and more beautiful that writing gets. It's so lyrical. And so this becomes a sapphic love story of two beings who just can't actually be with each other. And the stakes are so high, like they are on opposing sides of a war. In order to be together, they would have to betray everyone and everything they've ever known. And let me just read you this page because holy shit. Dear Red Sky and Morning, don't shorten your letters. You ask if I've been lonely. I hardly know how to answer. I have observed friendship as one observes high holy days, breathtakingly short, whirlwinds of intimate endeavor, frenzied carousing, the sharing of food, of wine, of honey, compressed always, and gone as soon as they come. It is often my duty to fall in love convincingly, and certainly, I've received no complaints. But that is work, and there are better things of which to write. Are you kidding me? And obviously I won't spoil the ending, but it shattered my heart. So for me, it was really a book of two halves because firstly, it tugged at my patience. And then in the second half, it tugged at my heartstrings. Jeez. Like I said, lyrically written, it's intimate. It's an epic love story about prohibited love and treachery and trust and yearning and communication and being star-crossed lovers. It is eventually so powerful, but you have got to work for it. And I was very close to giving up on this, but I'm so, so glad that I didn't. So yeah, this is how you lose the time war. Finally, a book with good and consistent pacing. I thought this day would never come. This is Love in Colour, and this gorgeous jacket was designed by Caroline Young. Now, I don't know if any of you have noticed this, but these vibrantly colourful covers with two silhouettes on the front have the publishing industry in a chokehold. Every piece of literary fiction has this kind of cover. When Olivia Rodrigo wrote Deja Vu, I think this might have been what she was referring to. It's like the North Face puffer jacket of book cover designs. Everyone has it. And I would just like to clarify, I have a North Face puffer, like, I'm here for it. And you know what? It works because I will pick up every book with a cover like this, thank you. I'm a basic bitch and I'm owning it. As soon as I saw this cover, I thought, you're coming home with me. It also has a quoted review from Candice Carty Williams on the cover. She wrote Queenie. And I wanted to point that out as well because endorsements from other authors do make us want to pick up books. Love in Colour retells and reimagines mythology from lots of different countries and cultures all around the world. And it retells them in a modern context and it is masterful. As you know, I'm a big mythology nerd and I really enjoyed the huge mix of mythology that is encapsulated in one book because there were some that I knew quite well and others that I'd never even heard. Of. But this mythology is just brought to life by Bolu Babalola. She writes in such a captivating and witty way. It's joyful, it's vivid, the stories are given a contemporary twist but in a really natural way. She perfectly breathes life into this mythology without losing its integrity, I guess. I especially loved um, Scheherazade. I suppose if I tell our story, I should start at the beginning. That's the convention, right? Once upon a time. Except you and I don't feel bound by the temporal. Not in a pretentious, mystical way because I'm not into all of that. But very basically, we were not a once, and we were never pinned to a time. Like, are you shitting my dick right now? That is stunning, it's exquisite, it's magical, and the diversity in this book is so powerful and game-changing. So that is how it's done. 
And just like that, we're back to slow burn. This cover was designed by Anne Morrison, and I thought it was so interesting to juxtapose the innocence of this young child with her rosy cheeks and her little collar with the sinister nature of this mask. And the fact that it is a mask suggests that it's some kind of act, it's some kind of performance, a facade. Her features are all very round and curved. And then by contrast, you have the wolf's ears and fangs, which are really sharp and pointed, and they're right on top of each other, but only connected by this really thin string. The word castle suggests this setting of huge grandeur and size and this a massive edifice, which massively contrasts with the idea of being lonely and this one solitary figure. I think it exaggerates that figures are loneless. And then finally the word mirror, you know, looking at your reflection, being very introspective and self-assessing, I guess. I thought the cover and the title were genius. And also, I do think it's worth mentioning, at the top it says the prize-winning Japanese number one bestseller. Firstly, prize-winning makes you feel like some sort of authority has approved of this and therefore it's guaranteed to be at least a little bit good, but also it's a Japanese number one bestseller and I've had a really good experience with Japanese books. So it gives a bit of an indication that there might be some magical realism and also a microscopic analysis of a complex character that Japanese authors are so brilliant at. Also, the shade of pink is nice. <laughs> And sometimes it's as simple as that. Sometimes it's an intellectual thing, sometimes it's just me see pretty thing and me buy. So Lonely Castle in the Mirror is about a young girl who drops out of school. Then one day when she's at home, she notices that her mirror in her room is glowing. And so of course, like any sane and rational human being would, she walks through it. And when she steps through, she finds herself in this huge fairy tale castle. And when she's there, she finds six other teenagers and a girl who is dressed in a wolf mask. So they're basically told, welcome to your all-inclusive holiday. You can come to this castle every day for a year if you want to, as long as you leave by 5 p.m. each day. Oh, and also, just to stir the pot a little bit, there's a key hidden somewhere in this castle, and whichever one of you finds it can have one wish granted. As soon as that wish is made, the castle and your memories of it will disappear forever. It's a very tender book, and it's fascinating to see the changing dynamics between these characters, you know, as they get more comfortable around each other and slowly begin to unravel. I just think that the pacing of this book is a huge issue because there's a chunk in the middle where it's just so repetitive and it just really dragged and <laughs> I mean truly it does make you feel like a whole year has passed but not in a good way. Honestly, this plunged me into a bit of a reading slump because I just did not want to pick this up because you would read for like 70 pages and nothing would happen. However, I think the common theme in this video has been that I'm glad I stuck with it because there's some great twists and huge reveals at the end which do make the whole thing kind of worth your while. Although, and I hate when people do this, but I did kind of guess <laughs> what was going to happen. Again, don't want to ruin it, so I'll be very ambiguous here, but the major, major twist that happens right at the end kind of relies on something that we only found out 20 pages before. And I just thought maybe the tension could have been raised a bit, maybe the pacing could have been improved if we'd found that out at like, the halfway point, maybe? But then again, I'm not a Japanese number one bestseller, so who am I to judge? The fact of the matter is that this has been a huge seller in Japan because apparently dropout rates at schools are really, really high. So I think that a lot of people have found comfort in this by getting to observe characters who are like them. What I would say is that in the UK, I feel like this has been marketed as adult fiction when really it's YA, because sometimes it's just a little bit too didactic and the characters are sort of exaggerated caricatures. So, hmm, a mixed review, I think, from me. Something I'm glad to have read, but not something I necessarily fell in love with, and it didn't have lines that made me, you know, scream with excitement. Oh, and I should add that the translation was by Philip Gabriel. So yeah, I do think that the cover does give you a bit of a taster of what the book is about, but, um, just needed better pacing for me. So, what is the conclusion here? Should you judge books by their covers? Probably not. I should stop doing that, really. But am I going to? No. I looked my toxic trait right in the eye and I said, I see you and I'm going to continue doing you anyway. <laughs> this is about self-awareness, not self-improvement. <laughs> Those are not the same thing. In fact, I literally bought a book today because of the cover design. Like, look at this, isn't that stunning? This is the Master and Margarita 50th anniversary edition. And she's a stunner. I mean, look at those deckled edges. I'm a slut for some deckled edges, damn. I will say though, I found this video really fascinating for me to kind of dive into the psychology behind cover designs and how we're sort of lured in. I definitely am. And I also found that sometimes, unfortunately, those cover designs are overcompensating and I'm talking about notebooks in particular. Maybe it's quite wholesome because the message of this video is essentially, it's what's inside that counts. 
So that's... That's quite nice. It's also quite cheesy. That, that's not just cheesy, that's a whole charcuterie board. So anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed taking this journey with me. Of course, a massive shout out to Karma for very kindly sponsoring this video and supporting my channel. Link is down below. Don't forget, you can click subscribe if you're feeling generous, feel like doing some charity work today. I'd appreciate it. And until next time, all the best, stay in touch, have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.